Hey guys, we have a Bankless Takes episode for you today on the docket. Is Ethereum changing its monetary policy again? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Question for you, David. Um, so there's this debate in the Ethereum community right now, and I've been paying mm -hmm. attention to it, but a bit on the margins. I think you've been more directly paying attention to it. But um, it's a debate about changing the monetary policy of Ethereum, this, this holy ground we're treading in. Should we do it? Who gets to decide? What should the eventual monetary policy be? What's the context for this conversation? Yeah, so two Ethereum Foundation researchers uh, introduced a blog post, like a research blog post, proposing the idea of changing the monetary policy of ETH, changing the ETH issuance curve from what it is today to something else. Um, along with this research post came a proposal in alignment with the research post to include a change to ETH monetary policy for the next upcoming hard fork in Electra, which could be a hard fork as soon as the end of this year. Uh, and this um, expediency, this speed, created a ton of controversy and debate about the politics and optics of EF researchers rushing in a monetary policy change into the next hard fork. Uh, and this is something that some members of the Ethereum community had this like immediate negative reaction to. So really in this debate that we're experiencing, that we're seeing in the Ethereum community, there's really like two pillars here. There is, should we change the ETH monetary policy? And then there's also like the much more uh, controversial thing, which is like, what is the appropriate process for changing the ETH monetary policy? How fast mm. should this be? How rushed should this be? I think in this episode today, Ryan, I actually kind of want to just focus on the monetary policy of ETH. There's the politics around the governance of Ethereum that I think the community and EF researchers and core devs will all kind of figure out. That's not really our realm. Uh, what I'm primarily interested in is, are we at the end game of ETH's monetary policy? And if not, what should we do about it? And that's the subject of today's episode. Before we get into this episode, a quick shout out to our friends and sponsors over at Cartesi. What is Cartesi? Cartesi is the first modular execution layer with a Linux runtime and real world computing environment for Web3 devs. If that was kind of a mouthful to you, imagine running Doom as a layer two on Ethereum. So on-chain state with an on-chain gaming engine or anything else that like Linux can run. So you can boot up a Linux environment and leverage all of the like Linux developer ecosystem, code libraries, open source tooling, et cetera, that has been building around the Linux ecosystem. Uh, so you can do just a lot. You can do a lot with that, perhaps like literally infinity kinds of things with a Linux runtime on your chain. Uh, Cartesi is a, giving away $1 million in grants for their ecosystem, and this is now live. This is the call to action. So if you would like to apply to get some of that grant money, you can get up to $50,000 from Cartesi. There is a link in the show notes to get your uh, grant applied. They're giving it away, but you also, you got to earn it. You got to go gotta build something. That's uh, the old fashioned way, David. Um, all right. Should we get into the topic today? Yeah, let's do it. But maybe we should, let's go like all the way back. Let's just like start at the very fundamental foundation of just like monetary policy. Ryan, what's monetary policy? Monetary policy is how a entity kind of controls their money, right? And I would say that any, any um, money that... Mm -hmm has supply that is somehow impacted or arranged by human beings has a monetary policy associated with it. Actually, so not gold. Gold Does gold have a monetary policy? I would say it does. It's just like actually completely uh, immutable Rigid. from a Rigid, nature yeah. perspective, right? Yeah. Unless, unless we can find some way to do alchemy, which is uh, you know, eluded us through through all of uh, yeah, human civilization, Science, but just yeah. go gold is birthed in uh, the aftermath of a supernova explosion, right? It's a on the periodic table of elements. There's only a certain amount of gold in the universe, and so it sort of derived its um, scarcity due to that. Everything else besides natural elements, even Bitcoin, even Ethereum, we'll get into it, uh, and especially fiat currencies, they all have a monetary policy, which is just their issuance. How much of the supply are they issuing both now, in the past, and into the future? What would you add to that? Yeah, I would say monetary policy, like on the human tech tree of like advances in technology emerges sometime after both government and army. Uh, and so like armies, they protect a fiat currency, right? They en enforce its value. 
uh, governments like produce the actual monetary policy and, and then armies give these governments power. Uh, and so like, it, you know, it's a human controlled phenomenon. Policy implies some sort of like opinion about what money should be. Uh, and so I call it, I call it like relatively like a new phenomenon in the world. Uh, and then monetary policy really came into like, it's, you know, it's like climax post, um, the uh the gold leaving the gold standard right so like we had monetary policy before while we were on the gold standard as the dollar uh but it was really amount of like how much uh fractional reserve are we okay with uh then when we, once we went off the gold standard we can like all right well we now have complete and con total control over the monetary policy of the u.s dollar uh and so it's been this emerging thing alongside the role of like fiat currencies yeah, maybe maybe we should uh, talk about that in the context of the different types of money that exist in a modern fiat-based economy, so a modern nation-state economy. And um, all of these are kind of like subject to manipulation because you mm -hmm. you just talked about the, you know the birth of government, the birth of sort of you know paper money, um, getting off of uh, you know the gold standard, which had sort of an, an immutable uh, monetary policy inherent in it. And there are like three, there, there's more than these, but the three areas of money that we could focus on are M0, M1, and M2. So money zero, money one, and money two. Money zero, maybe we should start there and, and do some quick definitions. So M0 is base money. What, what exactly is that? I call base money almost like bearer asset money. It's not a precise definition, but it's like kind of close. It's literally just like the raw underlying money of the whole economy, like literally printed dollars and then dollars also held like digitally at the Federal Reserve. Uh, so this is like strictly currency in circulation plus commercial bank reserve balances inside of the Federal Reserve. It's like the mo you can't there's no deeper level other than M0. So it's at like the basement level of currency. And, and you said the Federal Reserve. So this is kind of, um, we're, we're doing this mostly in, in US terms, of course. Uh, it's a, we're talking about the dollar as the unit of account here and, and mm -hmm. the dollar being sort of the, the reserve currency for the world right now. It makes sense to talk about the, the Federal Reserve and the dollar specifically. So that's all of the physical cash that you see in the economy shrinking, I would say. There's not, there's not much physical cash in our daily usage. And it's also the banknotes that are held at the Fed, the commercial banknotes held at the Fed. And if we look at what that number is right now, this is um, monetary base, total monetary base since 1959. And you can kind of mm -hmm. see this over time. So David, we are at about 5.8 a trillion dollars in M0 as of today. And you can see this chart. Um, it's you know, like pretty pretty stead, steady up curve through the, you know, the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, 2000s. And then, whoa, what's this? <laughs> 2008, <laughs> what happened here? And we shoot back up and uh, like the last, you know, 14 years or so have been the spike upwards in, in terms of M0 liquidity as, as more cash is uh, injected into the, the M0 economy. Yeah, there's worth. There's like two eras in this curve that really like stand out to me. There's the first era up to 2008, where like the slope is like pretty like linear, consistent, like regulated, dependable. And then 2008 happens, and then the curve is at first it jumps up, as in like we we added a lot of money supply into the world, but then it like kind of gets erratic and unpredictable, <laughs> and you can kind of see opinions showing up in M0. You can see this is the Federal Reserve started to be like, oh, you know what we can do? We can like leverage these levers. We can spin these dials a lot more than we have. I and mean, this call kind of came into vogue in 2008. You said opinions, but in, I, would, I would go into more detail on those opinions. They seem like very short-term opinions. It seems like somebody is drunk on the levers and just like <laughs> leaning into them, like jerking them one direction or another. It's much right. more jerky. Opinions yeah, were jerky. expressed before this, but like they were very gradual. Right. You know, and yeah. here, here's uh, the, these incredible jerky ups and, and downs as far as M0, but always up. I'll note that it's up. almost always the long term trajectory is up. So that is M0. What's the next M that we should consider? Uh, we're going to talk about M1 and M2, but I just also kind of want to put an ed, um, a wedge between M0 and M1 that doesn't exist between M1 and M2. Um, M1 is derivative money. Uh, and M2 is also derivative money. So like we're now, once you go beyond zero, you're t into the world of derivative money. And really like M1, M2, M3, technically it keeps on going. It's like M, N, like 
an infinite number. Uh, but really, once you start to get beyond M3, it starts to get kind of um, uh, foggy. Um, M1, derivative money, first order derivative money is money like with a trusted intermediary. Uh, it generally includes the most liquid forms of money, things that are essentially money without actually being money that can quickly and easily be used for transactions. Uh, this is money um, uh, held in commercial banks, uh, savings held by banks and financial institutions. It's basically base money with a single order of intermediary between you, the user of M1 and base money. So like I would simply very call it like M1 is like first order derivative money. Very liquid, uh, but just not as perfectly liquid as M0. So the way this manifests to you is so M M0, of course, is like a $20 bill in your wallet, okay? Mm -hmm. M1 yep. is the money in your savings account, your checkings account in yep. Wells Fargo, right? right. That's, that's very, what Very, very accessible, but technically still subject to run on the banks. Yeah, exactly. It's their, you know, PayPal, it's, you know, all, all of the digital money that you see in kind of like your own consumer personal savings account. That's sort of M1. It's kind of yeah. the, the stuff that we uh, you know, like basically use today. The point is, is that there's risk at M1 and there's zero risk at M0. Like the, with any sort of centralized trusted intermediary, there's insolvency risk, credit risk, uh, you know, theft risk. There's some sort of trust happening at the M1 layer, which is the meaningful differentiation between M0 and any other M, which is like there's a intermediary between you and anything above M. -0. Right. I don't feel like we feel that uh, trust anymore. Like it doesn't feel risky anymore because you know there used to be runs on the banks and things like this where the, your your M one is at risk and you better switch your bank. Now we have mm -hmm. FDIC insurance up to two hundred fifty k, and it seems like the, the 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 you know Fed system will bail out any bank that like leads to insolvency. But uh, I I guess there is some risk here. Uh, one important point to note is. Um, this is a lot bigger in terms of uh, like M yes. M one is a like it's it's much larger. It's kind of like right. a, another circle uh, outer layer. I would say if if just M zero is kind of the nucleus, M one sort of surrounds it. We're looking at about seventeen point eighteen trillion dollars right. of M one right now versus the five point nine trillion of M zero. And part of this comes from the fractional reserve layer of the commercial banks. Exactly. So like $1 in turns into like $10 out at the commercial banking layer. Uh, and so this is where we see like expansion of the monetary supply. Um, whereas the monetary base is at one number, the M1 number will always be some sort of multiplier on that because we have, we live inside of a fractional reserve system. So David, if you thought the M0 chart was uh, ridiculous with all of these ups and downs, <laughs> uh, look at the M1 chart here. And not much actually occurred in uh, like M1 supply in uh, right. 2008, but something happened around 2020. And we see this absolutely like massive mountain cliff edge spiking upwards. Uh, what is that? What happened here? Yeah, well, starting actually back at 2008, it's, it's notable that M1 did not go down during 2008, even when, like, uh, according to central bankers, we were on the brink, right? We were on the brink of a, of a fin financial depression. But, like, we learned from the financial depression that we need to quickly inject stimulus into the economy. And so we did that. Uh, and without being an expert in, like, the history of fe the Federal Reserve, like, kind of staved away like a, a meaningful amount of depression out of the post 2008 economy. What happened after 2008 is like you see the inc the the steady slope upwards of uh, M1 actually accelerate from pre 2008 to post 2008. Then we hit COVID. COVID, and COVID stimulus, we, wow. COVID stimulus was like a different beast in which like everyone's memory goes back to 2008 and we're like, you know what worked in 2008? Stimulus. We're going into COVID. We're going into a pandemic. You know what we should do? Stimulus. Turns out like the COVID crisis and the 2008 crisis were like meaningfully different types of financial crises. And we only really know this in hindsight, in hindsight, but like the COVID crisis didn't necessarily justify the amount of stimulus that we got. But nonetheless, we made that happen. And so like it's hard to express how vertical the COVID M1 growth uh, line is, but it goes from four trillion dollars up to like what is that 12 16 trillion dollars inside of one year like inside of maybe a quarter or two and so we just quadrupled the m1 supply of money inside of the economy in 2020 because of covid 
And then like what happens? We experience inflation for the first time in like 30 years, like go figure. Uh, and then it also continues to rise up until the point where you actually see it come down a little bit when we all remember the Federal Reserve hiking interest rates for the fastest time since like 40 years or something. Yeah, tightening, right, basically. Tightening. So tightening. we were doing the opposite of, of tightening. We were doing massive expansion very quickly in M1, mm -hmm. and then we moved back to tightening. So we've got our M0, we've got our uh, M1. Just wrap a bill on this. How about M2? What, what does that include? Yeah, that's just even more uh, derivatives on money. That's le even less liquid than M1. This is commercial bank and credit loans. Uh, so this is money in money markets. Uh, this is money available to banks and financial institutions for lending. So it's money that's been put into a bank, turned into M1, and then it's lent out again uh, to money market funds or other, or, or other creditors or lenders, creating M2. Still very liquid, but like you have like a couple orders of derivation, which separates it from M0. Okay, and so the total amount in M2 is uh, 20 trillion. So uh, larger than M1, uh, certainly yeah. significantly larger than M0. So this is how the, the money that we experience in, in the typical fiat system, this is essentially how supply issuance monetary policy is kind of like managed. So, so what's the problem with this, David? Or what can be the problem with this? What is the criticism of uh, you know, cent central banking policy from, let's say, you know, Austrians and, and those who think that... Uh, all of this expansion could lead to some disastrous effects. Yeah, so there's a, a number of different ways to approach this conversation. First, I would say just like the central bank influences control over like a mass number of people's lives through the levers and dials that they have control over at the Federal Reserve. Like we have all been uh, told that a 2% inflation rate is good uh, and that we should accept that and that uh, the dilution of our money by 2% every single year is like good for society. That's something that we are just told. Um, there's also, uh, since the, the, the central bank also kind of influences its control over the commercial banking layer, which is the layer that all like the average Joe has the relationship with. And so there's, it's, it's really just a huge intermediary between you, the individual, the market participant, and the money that you use. Uh, and so like when you use the dollar, which is a liability from the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve is your counterparty. It is your counterparty on the other side of the transaction of you choosing to store your savings inside of a currency that is managed by the Federal Reserve. So like you as an individual, as a market participant, are giving up some of your sovereignty. Uh, some of your power and influence goes into the manager of your fiat currency. And as we kind of saw with the M1 or the M0, the very erratic nature post 2008, like these are people controlling the lives of like the entire globe uh, because every, every transaction, one half of every transaction is fiat currency. Uh, and so one half of every transaction has this like one central intermediary, which is the Federal Reserve uh, and also commercial banks. Uh, and so, and when we talk about like living a bankless life or living a, a being a self-sovereign individual, uh, having a central bank is a obstacle to that because their choices impact us and they are humans and they are folly and they make choices that impact the entire globe. So this gives a tremendous amount of power to sort of the, the central bankers around the world to, to effectively make decisions. Uh, and um, like this is kind of like an issuance tax. Now, we're only looking at one side of the, the equation. So this is not showing us um, the demand side for these dollars, mm -hmm. right? This is just the underlying issuance. And since you mentioned it, you, you mentioned 2% inflation. I think it's important to draw the distinction, distinction between what we've been talking about, which is issuance and inflation. So inflation in itself is just the purchasing power that your unit of currency has, your unit of money has for some basket of goods. Let's say it's like food, you know, shelter, um, like energy costs, that, that, that is a basket of goods that is sort of defined. And inflation is different than issuance, okay? So like issuance can spike up, but you might not necessarily feel that in terms of inflation, at least not right away, not immediately, because your purchasing power may not change, right? And so the, the Fed mandate, it's important to know when the central bankers around the world are kind of like managing the dials and the knobs for this, they don't, they're, their mandate, they don't really care about issuance. They're not managing to an issuance curve. They're managing to things like unemployment rate in the economy, healthy GDP. They're trying to, at least they say, they're trying to get inflation to a 2% uh, 
annual range per year. They're not managing to issuance styles. Like at some level, they don't really care about issuance unless it starts to impact the things that they're really managing, which is like inflation, the overall GDP of the, the economy, and, and only then do they actually care. The problem with this though, David, is that the, the issuance expansion of supply does tend to manifest in inflation over time. So this is a chart of um, actual inflation from the early 1900s, so 1913. Uh, over time. So you could see you're starting on this chart with about $10. And if you scroll all the way forward to February 2024, um, it takes, it requires $310 to have the exact same purchasing power of $10 that you had a year ago. Another another way to show this chart is sort of like what's the purchasing power of a consumer dollar from the early 1900s to you know the 2020s where we are. The dollar has lost over 97% of its value since you know 1913 so if you're holding wealth at least over the long term in a dollar it's basically a shit coin like you're not actually able to hold your wealth over uh any period of time yeah and this is something that like of course early bitcoiners uh instantiated inside of their culture which is like we don't stand for this uh in fact the purchasing power of money ought to go up over time not down over time uh the loss of the value of the dollar came to the benefit of a select few individuals. There's this concept called the, the Cantillon effect, uh, where the people who are most proximate to the issuance of money benefit the most because they are nearest to the money printer. Uh, and so they get to purchase goods before inflation sets in. Actually, they are the cause of inflation because they have this privilege of buying goods uh, before inflation defines other people's value of their savings. And so Bitcoin has always been this reaction to this phenomenon. Like, what if we actually had a supply schedule of our money that was not responding to human incentives or human desires of a select few people? And instead, what if we use this money that stayed stable in supply and in theory would actually grow in value as a function of its demand inside of the economy? Uh, and so this is the Bitcoin um, theory. The Bitcoin idea is like you just take this little decaying dollar graph and invert it. Whereas, in, whereas the dollar loses money over time, Bitcoin would, in theory, grow in value over time as a function of the growth of the GDP around Bitcoin. I, I think the way that's best expressed, though, is like that, that's sort of a theory. The, the, the practice of that, though, is there's an algorithmic issuance policy. So they look at sort of the Fed M1 and M2 and these spikes and, the, you know, 12 guys in a room sort of controlling uh, how much money is printed at any specific time. They say, let's get rid of all of that. Let's have a simple, algorithmically defined uh, issuance policy. And this is the Bitcoin issuance schedule. Maybe you could kind of define this. So this is a chart that looks uh, much less sporadic, uh, much more calculated, much more planned. It mm -hmm. starts at uh, zero, of course, and it ends at 21 million, uh, circa you know 2041 or so. This is the Bitcoin issuance schedule. This is the Bitcoin monetary policy. This is essentially Bitcoin M0. What is the M0 calculation, David? Yeah, so there's a, when you look at this graph, you get a very clear idea. It's like, oh, there's an algorithm happening here. Um, Bitcoin, before I define that algorithm, which is very simple to define, one of the benefits of Bitcoin, like I'll, I'll just first state that Bitcoin established the first non-sovereign monetary policy ever. And so back when we were kind of defining monetary policy, like on the human tech tree, you needed both like a government and an army to f create and then protect and manage a fiat currency. And this is really the novel institution that Bitcoin created. It has its army. It's called proof of work miners. Mm -hmm. It has its currency. It's called the BTC token, the BTC asset. It has its monetary policy, which is this algorithm, which from 2009 to 2012, the first like two and a half years of Bitcoin, miners received 50 Bitcoins for every single block that was mined, largely when Bitcoin was like completely valueless. Like it started to have a value 2011, um, but people were receiving 50 Bitcoins and they were mining on their CPUs. It was very easy to mine. It was very, actually very loose monetary policy at the very, very beginning. Uh, and then the supply schedule of Bitcoin is that every four years, the issuance of Bitcoin on a per block basis gets cut in half. This is why we call this the halvening. So November 2012 was the first happening, reducing the supply of issuance on a Bitcoin basis per block to 25. July 2016, the seven, second happening, 12 and a half Bitcoin per block. May 2020, the third happening, 6.25 Bitcoin per block. And then, Ryan, next week, actually, hmm. 
2024, the next happening will reduce Bitcoin reward per block to 3.125. Uh, and then eventually at 2140, we will approach 21 million Bitcoins. And once we hit that 21 million Bitcoins we're done. per block, we're done. There will be zero more issuance on a per block basis for Bitcoin. Uh, and this is something that you can review and audit the code on in the side of the Bitcoin system. And it has been executing according to that code since the inception of the Bitcoin machine, the Bitcoin system, unlike the Federal Reserve, which changes, which is why we have FOMC day. Like FOMC day is, is the feds deciding to uh, so alerting us issuance. to a change <laughs> that they're going to change the issuance. It's, it's their and that's why point. everyone pays attention to FOMC. Yeah. And with this is defining code. I, I like that point you made earlier, which is like, so w when you look at sort of monies in the past, we had nature, of course, which really doesn't have mm -hmm. nature defined monetary policy, if you can even call it that. Then we had nation states, which is government and army. It's like violence. And now we have algorithmic uh, monetary Satoshi, policy. Satoshi, a human, did create monetary policy in Bitcoin, he just threw away the keys. Yeah, uh, ba basically. And it's um, the crypto economic incentives that actually uh, make this thing go. It, and another important important point to, to note, of course, there, on this chart, we're seeing Bitcoin issuance schedule. This is M0, okay? So there's no notion mm -hmm. of M1, M2. Right. The M1 in the Bitcoin economy would essentially be Bitcoin in an exchange, let's say. And so most or of the WBTC time, BTC on Ethereum, or or wrap Bitcoin on Ethereum. Most of the time, that is not fractional reserve, so it's a one to one. So, mm -hmm. except in cases right. like FTX, where the Bitcoin yes. wasn't actually Celsius, there. Yeah. So, like, uh, yeah. if you put your Bitcoin in Coinbase, that becomes M one, but it's not a right. fractional reserve system. It's like one Bitcoin in Coinbase for for one actual Bitcoin issuance. It doesn't really affect the total amount right. of Bitcoin in in circulation. All right. The only reason why it doesn't affect that is because there's kind of this like social contract to, hey, don't don't uh, fractionally reserve Bitcoin because no one wants your fractional reserve Bitcoin. Well, we actually kind of consider we've that tried a that a couple times. Space. Right. Like and so what happens is uh, things like BlockFi and like like right. Grayscale and, you know, FTX. And this, mm -hmm. this is why there's this notion of not your keys, not not your crypto is because sometimes right. banks can go fractional, fractionally reserve things behind the scenes you don't even know. They don't tell you because their ledger is a little bit different. So we did all of that to set up the conversation we're about to have, which is Ethereum's current monetary policy and the changes that are mm -hmm. maybe being proposed. Are they being proposed? I'm not sure. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But before we do, we want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible. A non-fractional reserve crypto exchange. <laughs> check <laughs> if you do out. not have an account with Kraken, <laughs> check them out. If you want a crypto trading experience backed by world-class security and award-winning support teams, then head over to Kraken, one of the longest standing and most secure crypto platforms in the world. Kraken is on a journey to build a more accessible, inclusive, and fair financial system, making it simple and secure for everyone, everywhere, to trade crypto. Kraken's intuitive trading tools are designed to grow with you, empowering you to make your first or your hundredth trade in just a few clicks. And there's an award-winning client support team available 24-7 to help you along the way, along with a whole range of educational guides, articles, and videos. With products and features like Kraken Pro and Kraken NFT Marketplace and a seamless app to bring it all together, it's really the perfect place to get your complete crypto experience. So check out the simple, secure, and powerful way for everyone to trade crypto, whether you're a complete beginner or a seasoned Pro. Go to kraken.com slash bankless to see what crypto can be. Not investment advice, crypto trading involves risk of loss. Celo is the mobile first EVM compatible carbon negative blockchain built for the real world. Driving real world use cases like mobile payments and mobile DeFi and with Opera Minipay as one of the fastest growing Web3 wallets, Celo is seeing a meteoric rise with over 300 million transactions and 1.5 million monthly active addresses. And now Celo is looking to come home to Ethereum as a layer two. Optimism, Polygon, Matter Labs, and Arbitrum have all thrown their hats in the ring for the Celo Layer 2 to build upon their stacks. Why the competition? The Celo Layer 2 will bring huge advantages like a decentralized sequencer, off-chain data availability secured by Ethereum validators, and one block finality. What does that all mean for you? With Celo Layer 2, gas fees will stay low and you can even pay for gas natively using ERC20 tokens, sending crypto to phone numbers across wallets using Social Connect. But Celo is a community-governed protocol. This means that Celo needs you to weigh in and make your voice heard. Join the conversation in the Celo forums. Follow Follow Cello on Twitter and visit cello.org to shape the future of Ethereum. 
Mantle, formerly known as BitDAO, is the first DAO-led Web3 ecosystem, all built on top of Mantle's first core product, the Mantle Network, a brand new high-performance Ethereum Layer 2 built using the OP stack, but uses Eigenlayer's data availability solution instead of the expensive Ethereum Layer 1. Not only does this reduce Mantle Network's gas fees by 80%, but it also reduces gas fee volatility, providing a more stable foundation for Mantle's applications. The Mantle Treasury is one of the biggest DAO-owned treasuries, which is seeding an ecosystem of projects from all around the Web3 space for Mantle. Mantle already has sub-communities from around Web3 onboarded, like Game7 for Web3 Gaming, and Bybit for TVL and Liquidity and OnRamps. So if you want to build on the Mantle network, Mantle is offering a grants program that provides milestone-based funding to promising projects that help expand, secure, and decentralize Mantle. If you want to get started working with the first DAO-led Layer 2 ecosystem, check out Mantle at mantle.xyz and follow them on Twitter at 0xMantle. Ethereum's monetary policy. All right, this is a different curve. Looks a little bit different than Bitcoin, although like not smooth. Too much smoothish. Uh, like if you look at sort of the the line mm -hmm. of the last, um, you know, Ethereum's almost ten years old, so it's nine years or so. So, what is Ethereum's monetary policy? What has it been? What um, like changes? What events have occurred? Give it. Give us the timeline here in the rundown. I would actually say Ethereum kind of lacked a monetary policy, and perhaps even like continues to lack a monetary policy to this day. Uh, which is one of the biggest wedges, I would say, defined the difference between the Bitcoin and the Ethereum community. Um, Bitcoin, Ethereum started its monetary policy when the blockchain started, uh, which was initial block rewards will be five Ether per block with no future prescriptive nature about any changes in the future or like any sort of model or anything. It's just like, hey, we're going to build this Ethereum thing and we're going to issue five Ether block. Uh, during its proof of work phase. And that was uh, as much like kind of thought that went into the whole system. Uh, and so Ethereum Genesis block, July 30th, 2015, five Ether per block. Uh, October 16th in 2017, so a little over two years later, it was decided that Ether, uh, Ethereum was sufficiently secure and that we should reduce the issuance of Ether. So we went from five ETH to three ETH without really knowing what security is or any sort of like end game target, we just said, hey, like uh, Ethereum, the ETH price went up a lot. Uh, we are now issuing a lot of Ether in dollar terms. I think we can afford to like reduce the supply of Ether into the market. So we did in 2017. Um, February 28th was the next one, 2019. Uh, the block reward went from three to two. Uh, so continuing a reduction of the issuance of Ether, again, without any sort of like rigorous nature. And then in December 1st, 2020, uh, we created the Beacon Chain. Uh, so the Beacon Chain was a separate blockchain running in parallel to Ethereum, which would eventually become merged with Ethereum. And this was when this weird phenomenon happened in which we had both the two Ether per, per proof of work block on the proof of work side of things being issued, and then also a marginal increase of Ether being issued because we were also securing the Beacon Chain in proof of stake. I think So I think it was something like, of a three to six percent increase in total ETH issuance because we had these two chains running in parallel. August 5th, 2021, we introduced EIP 1559 and we started the burn, which is one of the first like uh, opinionated directional uh, prescriptive natures about like what should the ETH monetary policy be. Uh, we decided that excess um, fees ought to be burned. So excess demand of the Ethereum economy, we burn those things. Um, and that started this whole meme around ultrasound money in 2015, uh, September 15th, 2022, we merged. So we deleted the two Ether per block reward on the proof of work chain. Uh, and we only had the beacon chain issuance, which was much smaller. Uh, and so this created, fulfilled this like idea of ultrasound money. Um, and it was a very constrained issuance algorithm with the burn. And this is actually the moment where ETH uh, went deflationary. So at the moment of the merge, there was more Ether in circulation than there is today. The supply of Ether, it goes up and down because we do issue Ether on the consensus layer, uh, but we burn Ether on the execution layer. Uh, this is like, of course, transaction fees. On net, since the merge, uh, the supply of Ether has gone down. I think we have burned something like two, two or three million Ether. Um, and... That is where things uh, are today. We uh, uh, activated withdrawals, but that actually didn't change the issuance curve of Ether. We activated withdrawals in April of 2023, and that is as things stand. 
this is the changes that went into effect. One ad I'd make there, David, and, and uh, it, maybe it's a qu quibble, sort of a semantics thing. Um, you said that uh, Ethereum has not had a monetary policy from the very beginning, and I would sort of agree with that, but also disagree. So, so like when you say it hasn't had a monetary policy, it's always had a monetary policy, but the monetary policy has been soft, let's say. It's been squishy. It hasn't been well-defined. It's not been like um, the Bitcoin monetary policy, which is what's our, we're going to have uh, the supply every four years and we're going to end up at 21 million. With, with Ethereum, it was basically like, we don't know where this thing's going to end. And it was like that in 2015. We're going to add a more precise, calculated, algorithmic monetary policy later but we don't know how much we're, we should actually be paying for uh, issuance, right? So that is a cost in the network. And of course, in these crypto economic systems, these, these uh, layer one blockchains that we're building, what does the issuance pays for? It pays for the army. It pays for the economic defense of the entire system. Um, I will say, though, since the early days, and this sort of uh, came to be verbalized in the Ethereum community, kind of like the social uh, layer of things that we often on Bankless call kind of like the layer zero that sits be, be beneath all of the chains. At the layer zero, around I would say 2017, 2018, the community started talking about the social contract of the Ethereum monetary policy, which is, um, as defined, minimum necessary issuance or minimum viable issuance, which basically means we're only going to issue blocks to pay for economic security. So it can't be siphoned away for any other use case because that is the most credibly neutral uh, way to sort of spend our block issuance money. And how much are we going to spend? The minimum necessary to what? Mm -hmm. Secure the network and keep it decentralized, right? And so if you go back to Satoshi's original 21 million, I'm not sure a lot of thought was given to that number. It's like, like, what do you think? I mean, he's probably just like, let's just do this every four years. You know, the Olympics happens every four years, whatever. Every four years, we'll just cut in half, we'll end up at 21 million, boom, put it in place, and it hasn't been touched since. That's the difference. Ethereum's has been changed, right? But I'm, I'm not sure it went through, um, like, any, like, I'm not sure that Bitcoin's issuance curve had any greater foresight into, let's let me calcul sit and calculate how much economic security Bitcoin needs in the fullness of time. And I come up with this, sure. mis, um, you know, like 21 million number. That is the answer to all of the problems. Uh, you know, Ethereum's just been a bit more gradual. It's been looser and has begun the hardening process, I would say. So the changes more recently have become less drastic, more algorithmic, but it certainly wasn't, it was loose on day one it is now less so, but it's not completely hardened either. Well, so the Bitcoin monetary policy, I, I agree, just didn't really have much uh, thought put into it. Kind of by design, like it was said, hey, a, a hard cap, 21 million, whatever, 100 million, whatever. So long as we approach a hard cap, then that's kind of the Bitcoin's monetary policy. And it was like simple by design. Like a hard cap is just a pretty simple thing. The only thing left, once you've decided that a hard cap is good, the only thing left to decide is how quickly or slowly that you get there and what kind of curve uh, it takes to get there. Um, what Bitcoin received as a result of that is predictability. Mm. This is the thing that Bitcoiners love about the Bitcoin monetary algorithm is that like you can just model it out independently and say like, oh, uh, at this particular date on this year, Bitcoin supply will be exactly this. And you will be like within like 98% of a correct answer. The only reason why there's a difference is because the hash rate on Bitcoin changes. With Ethereum, you've never had any sort of predictability. Uh, and so you don't really know what the supply of ETH will be at a given moment in future. And so this is kind of the problem with ETH's minimum viable issuance policy. I don't call it like a systemic problem, but like it's it's a vibe, not an algorithm. And actually no one really knows what minimum viable is uh, because you don't know what minimum, if you are approached a mini minimum until after your blockchain like gets economically attacked, which is not desirable. So you actually want to have a buffer above a minimum viable to stay away from it because you don't know where it is. Um, and this is one of the big concerns about the Ethereum system is like we have a direction, we have a vibe, but we are um, 
still left to be opinionated as to where that vibe is or how close to that vibe we want to go or the choices we want to make to get there. Well, there's two criticisms uh, that come, I think, from the the Bitcoin uh, community when you contrast that with Ethereum monetary policy. One is, you know, predictability, like you say, you can't sort of calculate mm-hmm. into the future. I think that's actually less of the concern for many uh, strong fundamental Bitcoiners. I think that is part of the concern. I think the major concern is you can't touch the dials because that's a, there's a slippery slope there. Once you start to change things at all, right? So then you introduce some humans that are able to change things. And that destroys the entire, I guess, uh, illusion that um, like of scarcity of your money, essentially. And I, I think among very strong Bitcoiners, they would say 21 million is Bitcoin. It can never be changed. If it is ever changed, of course, this is code. So you can hard fork Bitcoin. You could change it to 25 million instead of 21 million. You could you implement a 5% issuance. But the true deciders of what Bitcoin is, is actually the layer zero, is actually the social right. community. Who is actually running the Bitcoin software, right? Um, like the, between the miners and uh, those that can verify and validate the transactions that the miners put out. Who, who does the community actually, what does the community actually say is the true code for Bitcoin? And I think for Bitcoiners, some of them don't even acknowledge that the social layer exists. I've had m- right. many arguments with them in the, in the past. It's, hey, like it's all, you know, social layer, it's all layer zero at, at the end stage. There's an Ethereum layer zero with minimum viable issuance. The, and there's a Bitcoin 21 million, but you're still dependent on those nodes right. to kind of run the software. But they, the joke that I like to make about this yeah. is that the Bitcoin social contract is that there is no social contract. Yeah, exactly. Right. We don't talk about <laughs> which it. It's is, a fight which club is still rules. a social contract. We just don't talk about it. Right. Um, <laughs> but they're very uncomfortable, let's say, with the tweaks that um, human beings like core developers are able to make. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, like the decision that the community has to make is what do we do in the future with respect to issuance? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think that that kind of defines the differences between Ethereum and Bitcoin. I think Ethereum, the Ethereum uh, vibe about the monetary policy is like Bitcoin directionalism without being uh, Bitcoin precision. Uh, and so like we appreciate the idea of like, hey, don't touch the controls. Don't be don't be erratic, uh, be constrained. Uh, but we also as Ethe- the Ethereum culture say like, but we need to be pragmatic and we need to make sure that when we like tie our hands to the mast that we know that we've developed a system that is anti anti fragile and resilient. Yeah, and that's actually kind of getting to some of the um, uh, proposals from this ETH monetary update. Is we are th- we are considering the fact that we are not ready as an ETH monetary policy system to tie our hands to the mast and let the system don't go. ossify it too soon. Has been you know exactly. part of the social contract. But l- let me just say some things that would be clearly outside of the social contract, right? Of Ethereum, it's like mm-hmm. good luck getting this through, right? Is right. let's say you increase issuance by like one percent and you delegate that to core devs, uh, yeah. for for instance, that would be a change that would not go through because that is not encompassing with the minimum necessary issuance. And what would be the check on power to that is. The community would rebel. People would not yeah. accept that hard fork. It would like not go through the same way that that the 21 million mandate is upheld uh, with Bitcoin. So right. there are some things that are very clearly outside of minimum viable, minimum necessary issuance, uh, like mm-hmm. like that, for example. Um, and there's some things that are you, you, if you wanted to get that change in, you would first have to change the social contract of Ethereum, which is a very hard thing to do. I think so. Or else, what do you end up with? Right. This is hard fork governance choice. Lose. You'd you'd have you know Ethereum with um, like a like a uh, ETH grants and then actual Ethereum. Right. It's like it'd be a Ethereum Classic versus you know uh, Ethereum Original all over again. So you get kind of a hard fork. So where does that bring, just refresh us now. So you went through this, this timeline of Ethereum monetary policy and issuance. So mm-hmm. where are we now? Like there are some people I think that thought we were at the end of this, right? We did, right. We did the, the burn, we did the merge. Okay, we, we do have some sort of issuance um, like chart that like you know, shows what issuance will be in the future. There's some sort of uh, you know, algorithm involved here. W- where are we now? Aren't we done? Why aren't we done? I actually kind of want to go back to this one part of the changing evolution of the ETH monetary policy to a part that I'm wondering if listeners caught this as we kind of just, I kind of just glossed over it, which is um, when we created the proof of stake beacon chain. Uh, And then all of a sudden I said like, hey, proof of work rewards are happening. That's two Ether per block on the proof of work chain. And then also proof of stake rewards. 
but like, what's the supply schedule of the proof of stake chain? Because that's actually now the supply schedule of what we now call Ethereum. Uh, and so a lot of people kind of like glossed over how this uh, current curve of ETH monetary policy was selected. That's where the new uh, issuance there, is happening, you're saying? Yes, that's where the new issuance is happening, yes. And so there is this post inside of an ETH research forum uh, called uh, the Beacon Chain Consensus Spec. And it was about, uh, the, the post is signal non-final status of base reward and desired issuance goal. Uh, and so this is uh, the Ethereum researchers coming to some sort of equation about the proof of stake chain, which is the current Ethereum chain, and what the issuance should be. This is back in 2019 so, is the original date of this post, by the way. Yeah. So there's this equation that is the current monetary issuance schedule of Ethereum, which is the yield equals 2.6 times 64 over the square root of staked ETH. And that's the curve. Hmm. That is the equation. Uh, and this produces a logarithmic curve, so it starts very high on the y-axis at the very beginning, and then it tapers off very quickly, and then it slowly approaches zero at the end. Uh, and <laughs> there, the comments on this ETH research post, this forum on GitHub, uh, is pretty, pretty interesting. Um, Justin Drake uh, does says, below is my rationalization as to why these numbers are reasonable. And then he like targeting two to the 25 ETH at stake, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and then assuming each shard consumes an average of 1,000 ETH in gas per year, blah, 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 with half the gas burn, blah, blah, blah. And inflation would be about half a percent and the validator return would be 5%. Feels healthy, <laughs> point. Yeah. Which is like the level of rigor that went into this thing. is like True. Justin like did some napkin math and I've, I've seen Justin do napkin math before. He's generally directionally correct. Um, it's, pro it's, probably, just like <laughs> it's probably the same napkin math, though, that Satoshi did. It was like, probably, yeah. Let's have it every four years, end up yeah. at 21. Feels healthy, feels like it could but work. But like, Bitcoin gets that luxury because as long as they approach a hard cap, like, mission accomplished. Right. right? Like, Ethereum doesn't have that same luxury because that's just not what our vibe is. It's just I, the emphasis I want to place on this is like, Justin Drake did these like three sentences of napkin math and then says, feels healthy at the very end. Um, John Adler, if you scroll down, he quotes feels healthy and goes, that doesn't seem like a particularly rigorous metric. Neither does that this other blockchain <laughs> has X issuance rate and they haven't gone attacked yet. So X must be fine. Uh, why not outsource the task to an independent panel of actual economists? And so this is actually a question I have for you, Ryan. When we merged to proof of stake and enabled withdrawals, did you think that we were done with ETH monetary policy? Like, what did you think about ETH monetary policy at the time? Were we, like, hands off? Were you ready to go? This is going to be it? Or, like, we're going to have to change? What, what did you think about, like, the conclusion of ETH monetary policy once we went um, proof of stake and merge? I mean, I think it started off in, like, you know, 2015, 2016. It was more like it was just like a liquid. It was just kind of like, um, you know, water sloshing about or something like that. And then slowly it's hardened over time. And so, like, maybe, you know, 2018, it became like a jello type form. But I didn't feel like it was fully like concrete. There was still some um, hardening left to do. And so I felt like maybe there could be like one more, like maybe two, mm -hmm. but the changes would have to be um, like much more slight, uh, you know, not really affecting very much. I mean, it could be other burn mechanisms uh, that we introduce, for instance, sure. so, you know, like, but it would have to be in the spirit of minimum necessary, minimum viable issuance and like wouldn't be a major change that would affect everything. So just, a, a, yeah, it, not fully ossified, but real close, getting real close. Yeah, I remember thinking um, when, even before we merged, there, that there was never any sort of conversation about um, the ETH issuance curve out in public. It never really reached, um, I never heard about it really. And so like when we did the whole merge thing, I was like, you know, where did, where did we decide, where was the where conversation about ETH monetary from? policy? Where did those numbers come from? And like my intuition was because I didn't hear about it as like an, a more an external Ethereum community member, I, I kind of just assumed exactly what ultimately happened, which is just like we licked our fingers, stick it up in the air, felt the wind, and be like, "That's the vibe." Just, Let's go. It's that just way. not that different than what Satoshi probably did. It's just right. be, because you don't see how the sausage is made with Satoshi, mm -hmm. and it's shrouded in this mystery of a pseudonymous founder who just like kind of like set the yeah. the ship in the direction and just kind of like left then like that feels like it has much more narrative, I guess, legitimacy 
in terms of setting mm-hmm. the, the policy, then looking like you can actually see it in this link in GitHub and you kind of like see how it uh, came to be. Right. You, you see the inside uh, baseball, you see mm-hmm. how the sausage is made. Yeah. And so like always in the back of my head, I've always been like, there's, there's going to be one more because we did a bunch of unrigorous policy changes, directional, you know, self-correcting policy changes. But like in order to actually like tie our hands to the mass on one of Ethereum's most important pillars, which is its monetary policy, its security, like we need rigor and debate. And because we kind of just like glossed over that conversation when we picked that curve in proof of stake, I always in my mind was like, there's going to be one more. Like we're not done. Yeah. It felt like the network's not done yet, right? Like not all of the Mm -hmm. economic agents have entered, like in particular, like layer twos, we, we, we were, we're just on the cusp of these massive chains starting to consume Ethereum block space or just staking is new and liquid staking is new. And now Eigenlayer like has so entered the picture. so much data left to connect, we uh, collect. We don't even have an Ethereum ETF in, in the US, right? So the institutions haven't even entered. So how's, how are these economic players going to end? W- one other thing I'll just, just mention is a massive disadvantage in having a hard cap and saying like 21 million is you actually, we, we pointed this out in the kind of like the earlier days of bankless is, you actually don't know if that economic security is going to be enough to provide the level of like settlement that your layer one actually needs, right? So Bitcoin uh, you know, block rewards drop down to zero and will transaction fees be enough to pay for uncertain. a decentralized global settlement layer? Like uncertain, but it feels like, um, wow, that's, that's a pretty big they, risk. They've already tied their hands to the mask though, so... They're going to find out. Right. They're going to find out. Whereas um, Ethereum can be a bit more, uh, they can sort of wait the decisions over time and let all of the economic agents kind of enter before they fully ossify. So that brings us to the conversation that we are having we are right now. finally here. F- 50 minutes into this episode, we are finally arriving at modern times. So what is this? What is the debate? Right. What is the actual proposal? Why do we even need, why is anyone even proposing that we need to change issuance uh, in any way? So Ansgar and Casper from the Ethereum Foundation, these are researchers from the Ethereum Foundation, released this uh, ETH research blog post called End Game Staking Economics, A Case for Targeting. Uh, And so importantly, End Game, uh, rather than like, the Ethereum culture has, I don't know if you noticed this, but like started to replace this word ossification with End Game. Uh, And so like we're actually kind of removing ossification from our vernacular and kind of replacing it with End Game more and more and more. Uh, and so, like, we're, this is the attempt to discover the end game issuance curve for Ether, Ether's monetary policy. And importantly, this thing is, uh, they're calling for a case for targeting. Uh, and so, um, what's targeting? Targeting is basically trying to find a particular percent of Ether supply that is staked to Ethereum and targeting that number by putting bounds on the left and the right side of that target. Okay. Uh, and can, can I just understand that? So like sure. that, that is what they're trying to target is percent of ETH staked. They are not yes. trying to target issuance. They're not trying to, right. there's uh, just over 120 million Ether mm-hmm. in circulation. And that number can go up, it can go down based on like rewards versus burn they don't really care about that number. That's not the metric that they are targeting. What they care about is percent of ETH staked. And right now it's around like what, between 25 and 30%, something like that? Yeah, it's like just over 25%, but it has been increasing up only ever since inception. Okay, and so Ansgar and Casper, if I understand the contours of this proposal, they think it's Mm -hmm. a bad thing for Ethereum to go too high in terms of percent of ETH staked. So a bad scenario would be like 90, 95% ETH staked, like anything that is directionally close to that is bad. And around, you know, like 25 to 30%, 35, 40, like that feels like a safer zone. And so that's what Mm -hmm. they're, that's the, when you say targeting, that's the thing that they're targeting, yes? Yes, that's correct, yeah. And they also make an argument that like if we get uh, higher than 50% ETH staked, I'm not sure, I don't think this is in the blog post, so I might be putting words in their mouth, but the vibe is that like once you approach some like uh, uh, pass some equilibrium, like once you pass 50% of ETH staked, the difference between 50% and 100% of ETH staked is not the equivalent of between zero and 50%. Like once you hit 50%, like there's kind of a magnet at the 100% end 
and you, you very quickly approach 100%, and it's very hard to reverse that uh, for all the incentives of uh, e-staking. So that's the reason uh, that they're bringing this up before we cross these thresholds where it becomes right. harder and harder to kind of go back. C can we just, like, why? Why does it matter what percent of e-staked? Like, why is 90% a mm -hmm. bad thing, accor according to Casper and Ansgar? What reasons do they give? There's a number of different reasons. Um, maybe I'll kind of start by uh, defining the differences between solo staking and uh, staking service providers, what we would call LSTs. Um, LSTs, like Lido, Rocket Pool, you know, Stakewise, and now even LRTs, uh, liquid restaking tokens, do a very similar thing, if not more. They reduce the cost to stake. Um, do you hold any like RE or like stake teeth, yes. uh, Ryan? Yes. How uh, costly in terms of your time, energy, and capital was it to trade your ether for that stake teeth? Incredibly simple. Easier for like than technically running a, a solo staker, right. of course. There's just some associated risk. But there's also for me, right. it's like there's risk in running a solo staker as well. But very very right. easy from a like uh, just click a button. And also, if you were to solo stake your ether, you would not get staked ETH or our ETH in return. It's not liquid, uh, you mean? So it's not liquid, exactly. And so the incentive to use a, a liquid staked token is high because you get liquidity on your staked ETH. The cost of staking with a liquid staked token is very low. Uh, it's like 10% of your yield for Lido. But then you also don't have to run your own node. Uh, these professional operators are doing it for you. Uh, and so you actually like unburden yourself and you just pay, you know, a 10% fee to the Lido system. Uh, and so the costs of solo staking are like high because you can't restake and you have to run your own node. Uh, you get some fees back, but really uh, this is all compression of fees anyways. Like all these liquid staking providers are all competing on fees. Uh, and so by making it so incredibly easy to stake with a service provider, uh, we are basically assuming that the supply of staked ETH is going to approach 100% because the curve of ETH, the ETH monetary policy is logarithmic. It approaches, um, it, it marginally decreases in yields for the higher percent of ETH stake, but there's no real mechanism to prevent it from going to 100. And this was, this is true for like all of the uh, LSTs. Now we have LRTs doing token incentives like, like three-fourths, I think, of all new newly deposited uh, Ether into the beacon chain is going into Eigenlayer. And so this is an external force on uh, yield on Ether that's coming from outside of the protocol. So even that is pushing Ether into being liquid-staked Ether into being liquid-restaked Ether. Okay. So the, the argument is that uh, solo staking is fundamentally losing to staking service providers simply because of the dynamics of the supply curve. Okay, and why is that bad? Was it bad to, so ba basically the, one of the arguments here is that this would result, like if we don't change something, we'll have fewer, uh, solo stakers. And that is a bad thing for the network. Is, is this the argument and why? Not just fewer solo stakers. Uh, that's, that's one thing. And I think that's important, but also let's go back to what we were talking about with the federal reserve. We actually have a removal of M zero money from the Ethereum ecosystem. Mm. And we almost in, in a 100% LST staked world. We actually only have M1 money. And this is actually starting to get into one of the, my motivations for this episode because I actually think Bankless has a position here. Hmm. Uh, M1 money is intermediated money. Right. It is banked, banked <laughs> money. It's banked money. Right. And so Lido... Or it's like, more banked Rocket, on the spectrum. It's more banked. Yes. It's more banked. Even, even Rocket Pool, which is like uh, non-custodial and permissionless, is still intermediated by smart contracts, which have smart contract risk. And so we, uh, this current Ether monetary schedule, this curve, actually does not protect vanilla Ether. So it's actually one thing to talk about the protection of solo stakers, which I think is totally noble, and we should definitely consider that. I also think even more, much more critically, this is a conversation protecting raw vanilla Ether, M, the M0 of Ethereum. Base money, basically. Base money yeah. of Ethereum. And so the idea of constraining the supply of ETH staked is in protection of base money. It's, in, uh, it's a boon to the value of raw Ether at the cost of staked Ether in terms of value. So let me see if I can kind of connect those dots of why it's bad to have um, like all of the Ether inside of M1 rather than M0. Mm -hmm. So we're basically saying if you move from Ether to um, 
like Lido stake ETH, it, you're moving from M0 to M1 without realizing it. the same way if you put cash in an ATM, uh, inside an ATM and it goes in a bank account, well, you've just converted your M0 uh, into, into M1. You have sort of you know, a set of bankers that you're kind of dealing with. Now, there are levels of like what we mean by bankers, right? With Rocket Pool, it's much, much more decentralized. You're trusting some smart contracts, that sort of thing. There's actually no banker in the Rocket Pool system. There's just smart contracts. Right. So with, with Lido. The smart contracts are the bank, which we are generally cool with. With Lido, you have uh, some smart contract risk and then a permission set of validators. We've made that all decentralized right. over time. And then also yeah. you have kind of like a Lido governance token, which is again, mm-hmm. that's um, another layer of something, some sort of intermediary. Some, some intermediary. It could be light intermediary, maybe it's acceptable, but it's not as pristine as M0. Right. And then if you go to the extreme case where you have an exchange doing this and staking like a Kraken or Coinbase or something, well, that is purely, you know, see ETH on Coinbase, uh, for example, that that is purely banker inter- intermediated Ether. And imagine if that was mm-hmm. 90% of all ETH supply was staked inside of CETH. Well, if uh, uh, you know, like an exchange founder goes wrong, you get another Sam Bankman fried on, uh, uh, on the scene, they decide to fractionalize that Ether reserve, uh, then they can kind of do that. And there can be all sorts of shenanigans and we're left with the same system that we, um, that we left, where you have banker intermediated money. Uh, I, I guess it's sort of a, t- a tail wag the dog type of uh, scenario. Um, as well, where it's just like the protocol loses power to the banker cabal. Taking self-custody of your crypto is one of the most important things you can do on your bankless journey. It's also one of the hardest things to get right, with huge consequences if you don't. If you want help going bankless, talk to Casa. Casa helps you take custody of your crypto assets so you don't have to wonder whether you're doing it right. Casa is a one-stop shop for doing self-custody the right way. With Casa vaults, you can hold Ether, Bitcoin, stable coins, all with one simple app and multiple keys for the ultimate peace of mind with a support team to help you every step of the way. But it doesn't stop at self-custody because even though crypto is forever, you are not. We all plan on making life-changing wealth in crypto, but with Casa's inheritance product, life-changing wealth can elevate to generational wealth for your kids and your loved ones who don't know anything about crypto. With Casa, you won't lose your private keys and you won't accidentally take them to the grave either. Click the link in the description to get started securing your generational wealth. Launching a token? Don't let complex legal and tax issues slow you down. Toku provides specialized support to optimize your launch and ensure that you as a founder and your team and your investors get the most tax efficient outcomes. The Toku team understands the crypto space inside and out and will ensure your token launch is fully compliant while maximizing tax efficiency. Toku can connect you with the best attorneys if you need them to make sure that you have the best advice and Toku can help to optimize your taxes so you pay the least possible amount of taxes while still maintaining legal compliance. With Toku's guidance, you can concentrate on building your company while Toku handles the logistics. Token launches don't have to be complicated. Talk to Toku today to get a free initial token valuation. Right. Let's open up the uh, the image here where we have the three different options for the ETH supply curve, because I think we can um, do a little bit better uh, to explain what these um, what targeting is. Uh, I'll do my best to explain this for the podcast listeners. So we're looking at three different graphs, uh, three different supply curves of Ether, the asset. We have on the left, we have the current supply curve, which is, like I said, it's the yield to staking Ether is very high if there is not very much Ether being staked. And then as more Ether is staked, that yield comes down pretty rapidly at the beginning, and then it kind of just marginally uh, gets closer to zero. But there's also a meaningful buffer between zero uh, and the actual yield. So like the, you kind of always will receive, even when there's 100% ETH staked, I think at 100% ETH staked, all ETH staked gets about like 2.2% yield. Um, And so that's the current supply of things. And so that's one of the main reasons why there's this magnet in the current state of the Ethereum monetary policy, why there's this magnet approaching 100% ETH staked, because even at 100% ETH staked, everyone gets 2% who's staking their ETH. Now, the thing is, is that like, like I said, above 50%, really the incentive to stake your Ether doesn't come from the fact that Ethereum needs more security, it's actually motivated by removing yourself from dilution, like avoiding dilution, which isn't a good reason to actually have 100% ETH staked. Uh, once the, uh, and so like minimum viable issuance is somewhat similar to like minimum viable security. Like we actually don't want Ethereum to overpay for security. We don't want Ethereum to be over secure. It should be at a Goldilocks zone. It's kind of like one of the social contracts of Ethereum is like, Find the Goldilocks. 
Uh, and so this, by having like 2% for all stakers, even at 100% stake rate, really penalizes raw ETH and basically invalidates its ability to exist. So that, that's the current state of things. And that's the, the left side curve. Uh, we have two options that uh, is proposed in Onsgar's and Casper's research post, which is uh, option one, which is the uh, less uh, the less uh, critical, the the smaller of the two changes, less aggressive, which is less aggressive. Thank you. Which is take the exact same supply curve that we have and just lower the issuance. And so don't change the curve; just lower the total amount of ether being issued. And so at one hundred percent ETH staked actually there's zero issuance. And so you actually severely disincentivize the, or the power of that magnet to approach 100%. And so this assumes that there will be some sort of equilibrium discovered before we ever get to 100%, where just like the total issuance of Ethereum approaches zero as we approach 100% state. To kind of slow things so, down, you put the brakes on just, somewhere between exactly. the process, mm -hmm. like between the 25% of ETH staked and the, like the 90% like red zone, you're just right. kind of slowing that right. incentive down. That's exactly right. Like don't change the actual curve, just reduce the total supply of ether being issued to also reduce the incentive to create M1 money at the cost of M0. Okay. And then there's the more aggressive response, which is, Actually, let's add a new mechanism. Let's change the shape of the curve to make this curve become extremely aggressively avoiding 100%. And so this is like, so in, instead of like having a smooth log curve that's kind of basically just like, you know, shaped like a rounded L, it is an S curve. And so you have a very steep drop off at the very beginning as we do now, that mechanism stays the same. It highly incentivizes ETH to become staked at the very beginning of the curve where there's not much ETH stake. So it very strongly incentivizes higher than zero ETH staked. And so there's a very high yield to go from like zero to like 10 million ETH staked, which is exactly where, what it is today. And then there's a target, I call it like 25 million or 25% of all ETH staked, mm. where that is the flattest part of the curve. But then when we start to get uh, 30, 45%, 50%. And you're making these the, numbers up. That's not necessarily, I'm these but up. whatever I'm the target is, up. insert your I'm trying percentage to, yeah, target. I'm trying to like illustrate the shape of the curve. Okay. Yeah. Once you get a higher than the target, then the issuance of yield drastically decreases and actually goes negative. Negative yield? And, and so negative yield. And so think of trying to, for the podcast listeners, a very vertical line that drops, that approaches zero very, very quickly at the very beginning starts to become more horizontal and reaches its maximum level of horizontalness at the target. And then as it gets further away from the target, target being like at 25%, as it gets further away from the target, it starts to go back vertical, continuing downwards. So it's like a sideways S that uh, starts high and ends very low and actually drops off at the bottom because it goes negative. And so what this is doing is this is adding an opinion, adding an, a mechanism beyond the target that reduces ETH issuance and even allows it to go negative. And so what this would look like is that if you are staking your ether when there is negative issuance, you're staking your ether and you're actually having ether taking, taken away from you if you are staking your ether. So you have like ETH. 32 ETH in your validator and you're expecting mm -hmm. to receive some profit, but if it switches into negative issuance mode, then you, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're actually getting you're actually, ETH every yes. like block taken away from you, basically. And that, yes. that gets burnt, I would assume. It just goes somewhere. Yeah, it would probably just, it would just get deleted. And like that, it may be that on intuitively, like as a gut reaction, and people are like, well, that's crazy. Why, why would you do that? Well, like think about the incoming yields from Eigenlayer. What if the negative interest rates of Ethereum sure. is like negative 2%, so you are losing 2% every single year inside of the protocol, but you're, making but you're actually receiving 8% yeah, like, inside of yeah. Eigenlayer. And so you are net positive due to the external forces around Ethereum that's extra to the protocol, but the protocol constrains and protects itself uh, by penalizing people inside of the uh, beacon well, chain who are staking beyond a particular target. It's interesting how you frame this. And you say you're inserting an opinion by adding kind of this target and the negative rate. And, and I'll say, yes, you're inserting an opinion, but we already have an opinion here, right? Which is yes. the current shape right. of the curve, which kind of diminishes over time, is actually an expressed opinion already. Yeah. And we could mm -hmm. keep that opinion relatively the same, except just like modify it slightly or like, I guess change change the opinion at a more fundamental uh, level and add um, like kind of like negative issuance. But I guess you know 
the current approach that we have is already an opinion. It's important to note that it's just an opinion that we've been used to uh, because we've had it in place for the last like three years. Okay, so this is what they're proposing. And the idea, I guess the... Well, so maybe maybe just to really clarify what they're proposing. Okay. They, uh, they have created a proposal to include option one, the less aggressive change, into Electra, the next hard fork, which in the Ethereum context is like aggressive. Already. Just like, like you guys are changing I the see. supply curve. We're slapping this thing in. And this is why there's controversy is kind of the, the speed and the haste in which option one, the less aggressive curve, uh, the one without the second new opinion is being added. Into oh, that's why people are actually upset. They're like, okay, well, now you're trying to do this option one. We haven't had time to kind of like weigh in, give this some exactly. thought. And yeah. like, you're trying to like put this in a uh, hard fork. Now, when I, when I, and, and, and to be clear, this is not consensus. So by default, this is not going into the hard right. fork. They are just proposing that it does go into this the gets into another separate podcast. I don't want to do right now, right. which is like, yeah. how does how does a bill become a law? You know, how do, how does right. a, a, a Ethereum rough consensus? I don't want to do that podcast. Either. Yeah. <laughs> how does the EIP actually get, it's a messy process. Right. Let's just say that and yeah, you can't just create a research post and like propose mm-hmm. it for next hard fork. And suddenly it's there. Like this is the process of the community kind of vetting it. The, the other thing I've heard um, Ansgar and Casper like, like actually talk about this. And I think they're they're not like forcefully pushing this. They're very much wanting to have the discussion with the community in order to provoke that discussion. This is what you have to do. You have to write a post like this. You have to provoke it. And you actually have to like poke a little bit and you have to be like, this option one could be ready for the next uh, Ethereum hard fork. What what do you say? And so at at some level, this is exactly the conversation that the Ethereum community kind of should be um, having, I guess. Okay, so... uh, One of of the arguments that they make is that because we are in the current the shape that we have, yeah. there's actually there is no constraint on the total supply of ETH staked, and so one of the reasons why they are being aggressive with it is that they, like I said, are provoking it. But as we approach, you know, forty percent staked, fifty percent staked, sixty percent staked, it makes it harder to go back down to a lower number because you have some incumbents, dis- right? Right, you have incumbents. Like, well, you're already there, right? There's literally ether in the beacon chain, and so getting it back out is like a whole other step, and so. One of the arguments is that the, actually the quicker that we can do this, the less painful it is on net because it's less self correct Well, yeah, if you, fewer incumbents, fewer existing projects have like sort of based their entire ecosystem around the assumptions of the current curve, right? I was just even thinking our, mm-hmm. our, our conversation with Blast and Pac-Man, right? He built an entire layer two based on ETH stake yield. What happens mm-hmm. if that goes in the negative direction? A lot of downstream effects on the business model for that entire layer too, I, I would imagine, right? And so like this type of thing, the longer it uh, exists, um, is going to be harder to change. And so I, I guess with option one and option two, the entire idea is to target a, um, a lower percent of ETH staked. And in doing so, the protocol has greater control than kind of like the smart contracts and banking layer mm-hmm. that's kind of built on top of it. And we have more base money and that keeps mm-hmm. Ethereum, the argument would go, that keeps Ethereum more quote unquote decentralized. But the contrast with that, right, is because w- what I hear from, um, and I think Bankless is fully subscribed to this, we want Ether to be a monetary unit. We want it to be money. We sort of like mm-hmm. been talking about that for uh, you know, like a long time. I think most of the community now agrees with this, including Ansgar and Casper. And their argument for a proposal, like the, the options that they laid out is, if Ether is going to be a global permissionless uh, money, then M0 has to be very strong, right? We can't have everything turn into uh, M1, right? And then adv- like uh, the other side of the debate is also people who believe and want Ether to be money, a monetary uh, unit. Um, they say, well, the more times you tweak the algorithm for this and the supply curve, we have to go back to like factory reset. We have to go back to day zero and we have to say, well, it's been how many days since the Ethereum algorithm was actually tweaked? Right. And it opens up a, you know, like a, a layer or a narrative hole mm-hmm. for people to say, hey, you know, a few core devs can kind of change issuance at every time. See, you just did this in like the Electra Hard fork in 2024. And what's to say you're not going to do it in you know, like another year or two? And you'll keep changing it over time. So we're all ETH is money people, right? Like, right. Uh, is that the question of you know what side of the debate do you do you fall in? Is this worth weighing in on? I think that particular argument is actually relatively weak 
Um, I think you and I, as uh, children of 2016, 2017, Ethereum, this is when we learned about Ethereum. That particular context of Ethereum's era was uh, marked by Bitcoiners like bullying us about that exact point. And they've also like never really been right about what that. What you mean like, changing? Yeah, so, like, like anytime you change it is a bad yeah, for your just money. Like, Ethereum, Ethereum is a shit coin because it's just, it's no different from the Federal Reserve. Right. Like literally Anthony Pompagano tweeted this out one time. It's like if ETH is no different from the Federal Reserve. Uh, they change the monetary policy all the time. Uh, and like they were always, it was always just like not really representative of truth. Like they didn't, they don't change the monetary policy all the time. It happened like five times, four times. Uh, and it most importantly, it was always to the reduction of ETH supply. And, and I like, I'm very happy with the history of ETH monetary policy. I think we've made the right choices through and through and through. And so I'm less inclined on like breaking the Lindy of the current state of ETH monetary policy. You, you don't a, think, but, we, but you don't think that there's a, I don't, I don't think it's that big of a deal. You don't think that there's a sense of mysticism here. That's like, it's kind of the emperor like with no clothes. Uh, it, there, there's something about money that is mystical. It's mm. like high priest, like Satoshi has to devise this perfect, um, algorithm and then like disappear. And who knows why it's 21 million, why it's not something else. Like, do you think that the illusion of money starts to use its actual monetary process since it, all it is is a shared story if you start to erode the actual story and people see that it's just a you know, like some people writing code that actually created the the monetary policy i think the other side of the story is stronger uh notably both options here uh decrease the total issuance of ether so both option one and option two lower the issuance of ether both of them increase the moneyness of ether and so everything's a trade-off. Uh, we are changing the monetary policy one more time. Potentially. But at, potentially. Uh, but every single policy change ever made to Ethereum to this day, historically, has always reduced the supply of Ether, except for the one caveat when we made the beacon chain and we actually added issuance because of the proof of stake chain and parallel. But people just accepted that because it fit the story of Ethereum and it made sense. And this, these two options both reduce the total issuance of Ether, increase the value of base money. And so I think those, that side of the story is much more powerful than just like the Ethereum. It's not just the core devs. Like oh, the, so you do have an opinion on this. You, you like these options. I, or you I like have the, an opinion on You like the direction of these options. The, if, if one of these options increased the supply of, of Ether, increased the issuance, I would have much stronger It's outside of the... It, that, that would be contract of minimum. Both options are inside the, uh, the social contract of minimum viable issue. Do you think that um, these options strengthen the monetary properties of Ethereum? It's like, and massive. You do. Okay. But yeah. would you also yes. concede that from a narrative perspective, they first weaken it in the short run because you're injecting yet another change that the core devs yeah. have proposed? So in the short run, it weakens it, but in the long term, you think it strengthens it? I think it we uh, weakens it, sure, technically, marginally so, but I don't think it weakens it all that much. Like, I think the costs of changing the monetary policy of ETH are low. And you and the benefits that we get from this change are And high. you also, do you also believe that there should actually be an end game? Oh, is that, so, like, yes. here's another slippery right. slope argument. It's like, to, yeah, sure, it's always one more change, right? Like, there's always mm -hmm. another end yeah. game beyond the end game, and so you've called this the end game and then you'll like, you'll, you'll come up with another term for a new end state, you know, and want to change this again, uh, two years. Like, are you on team that monetary policy actually should ossify at some point and get, there should be an end game? I think option two is the most credible path to an end game, Ethereum, ether monetary policy economics. And this is, this is in the title of the blog post. It's, it's titled end game staking economics, a case for targeting. Uh, so like no, notably option one is not an end game to me. Uh, and option one, which is the keep the same supply curve, just lower the total issuance, uh, is buys us time to get to option two, which is the end game. The, the, uh, to be my own, uh, devil's advocate, like a failure scenario here is we choose option two say we choose 25% ETH targeting, uh, and then we actually learn that we, uh, that we approached minimum viable issuance and actually went too far, and we're actually less than viable issuance, and we're like, oh shit, too far, we actually have to increase issuance uh, because we went too far. That's like the bad case scenario. Uh, but I think we can, 25% um, is just a number I made up, 
uh, we can research that number. Maybe it's 33%, maybe it's 40%, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I think that we have plenty of tolerance here mm. to choose a number that's healthy uh, and that it, we, it will be sufficiently secure. And that the, the option two is the most credible path to choosing a monetary policy that we will never, ever have to touch again. Okay. So this is the first time I've, we've ever discussed this, by the way. Yeah. So I'm just kind of like form, formulating. Bank, uh, bankless that, that's your opinion. Then. I am telling my Ryan my opinion right now for the first time. So uh, you, do you want to hear my opinion? I think option two is not off the table and could be a mm -hmm. final like negative issuance resting uh, rate. Um, mm -hmm. I could be on board with something like option one that is much more moderate. But mm -hmm. overall, I feel like it's too soon to do something mm -hmm. as drastic as option two. Potentially option one, maybe not this year hard fork, but maybe the next. And, and the reason I say I feel like it's too soon is because the full uh, range of economic agents that we'll see in the future have not yet entered Ethereum in force, right? So we're just at the early outset of figuring out like what restaking is going to look like. And that could be a massive force, economic force mm -hmm. inside of uh, Ethereum's like, like monetary considerations. Uh, we don't have an Ether ETF. We have no idea how much Ether the institutions are actually going to like you know slurp up and how what what it looks like when a black rock with x percent of ether starts to flex its muscle and say we are now staking right like mm -hmm. what kind of ripple effects will that have on preserving this bit so i guess what i'd say is it's just it's just soon i'm glad we're having this conversation I worry about making a drastic decision. Option one is not that drastic, so I could sort of see the case for it, but I'm not necessarily sure that option one is like enough of a change that it's worth it to actually like open the door and change monetary policy yet again. I'd rather like, you know, measure twice, cut once is kind of sure. is kind of my my gut take on this. I think that that you are being reactive, which is which is totally fine. Really legit. Uh, you're being reactive to what uh, is going to be incoming data from future phenomenons. Um, I think my position is that we actually have sufficient data that we ought to do something now uh, because we actually do have informed uh, hypotheses about what's going to happen in the near term, which is like, well, wh what do you think? What do you think? We haven't, Agon Layer's not live yet. We haven't seen yield from AVS. But I'm sorry, what do you think is going to happen? More ETH is going to be saved. I see what you're saying. I see. So, so I think actually, and we have the data. I think that's kind of a, I think that's a valid point, right? Which is basically mm -hmm. what you're saying is we, we know what we want, which is mm -hmm. we don't want 100% of Ether being staked inside mm -hmm. M1 type vehicles, right? Or anything close to that. And we know we want to preserve an M0 base money on Ethereum, right? And in order to do that, we can't have like 60, 70, 80, 90% of ETH like staked. And so like, we know what the, the effect, the, the pulls are, we have basically a target rate. And so we should go ahead and do that. I, th I think there's, there's um, merit in that case. What I would say though is the Ethereum community is actually not necessarily on board with that yet. Like, I think we're still in the phase of the advocates for something like option two or even option one, quite frankly, still have to make the case to everyone in the entire uh, Ethereum ecosystem that like there should act, we should actually strive to have a target rate for percent of Ether staked. And I've seen parts of that argument, but I haven't seen that argument like strongly put, let's say, and to be compelling enough to get the vast majority of um, Ethereum ecosystem participants on board. And you also have counter, like Lido would not want that, right? Like I think you've heard uh, oh, Hasu's- yeah. No, Li Lido, Lido wants a 100% e-stake. There have been tweets from Lido team advocating for it. Publicly. Sure, and this like, is, we this want is, but Hasu also has said, I mean, we had an entire podcast about this. He, he said, mm -hmm. yeah, 100% ETH staked. Like you're going right. against gravity. It's, it's as, and it, by the way, it's yeah. not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. And so I feel like uh, in order to, do something like option one or option two, mm -hmm. you have to have more debate, more consensus, more justification, mm -hmm. more like there should be 
X percent of ETH staked. And it's obvious because of these reasons. Um, because otherwise it feels a little bit, um, God, I'm going to say it feels a little bit prog powy. <laughs> for people who don't know oh, that's we, a deep cut there's reference there's a lot of listeners who don't know about prog pal and i don't want I don't just want the, the entire community is not bought into even yeah. the idea of a target um yeah. eth rate right now right so okay so prog pal progressive uh proof of work uh was this uh proposed change to the ethereum hashing algorithm back in our proof of work days uh and i if i remember correctly it was very uh uh it was interested by the miners. The miners were interested in it uh, because it would brick ASICs. And I think this is right. It would brick ASICs and it would, it would be a boon to individual GPU um, operators. So like back in my GPU mining days, that would have been a boon to me. And it would have been a, uh, a penalty. There'd be for winners and losers. And basically you know, core winning. devs yeah. would get to decide kind of who they are basically, right? In the miner community. It yeah. never went through, but it was very never, controversial. Never on, actually, the, the, the reason why, this is a side quest. You know what? You know what happened actually? Why I didn't go why? through? Uh, because COVID fucked up the supply chain oh. <laughs> of the ASICs, and so the actual the progpal fears of ASICs incoming actually went away because COVID. Ended, I was against uh, it, the, by the way. I just thought it was stupid. The, because, most of the community was against. I, it. I thought it was stupid because we're doing staking anyway. Why are we messing with like yeah, mining? Yeah, that was also and, the you know, it became a non-issue, obviously, because we transitioned to staking. So as we go forward in this debate as to, like, what do about the um, supply of ETH staked, I want to um, call into attention option two, the more aggressive one, which preserves e vanilla raw ether uh, inside of the Ethereum economy. And I, I kind of want to put this into contrast of, like, many of the startups, including the ones that you and I are invested in both as angels and through Bankless Ventures. And these are like organizations like Lido, any LRT project. Um, like, uh, do, you, do you have staked ETH inside of like DeFi? Yeah. I have, I have staked ETH. In yeah, yeah. If you're a validator, um, you have like, a, a lot of people have vested interests in this is what you're saying. Right. And not changing so like, this. Uh, there's a lot of people with vested interests who want Ether to go into their project before touching the end consumer. Uh, and if we can target, um, if we target like 25% of ETH staked, it is a boon to raw vanilla ETH. It is a boon to like the long tail of Ethereum, to the average Joe who doesn't have to think about or kick the tires of every single like staking project, of which I think we also want many of them. Uh, and so like if there, say there's like negative uh, ETH yields, so like the net effect of, of ETH yield is uh, like 10% because of eigenlayer AVSs, because of the LRT incentives, et cetera. And so as a result of that, there is negative 3% inflation inside of the Ethereum beacon chain. And ETH stakers are just eating that negative inflation because they're getting yield from external forces, the external startups, like the LRT startups, the eigenlayer startups. Maybe you're just like Joe Schmo, average retail guy who doesn't want to be beholden to any LRT or doesn't want to have their ETH and eigenlayer just to stay, um, do not just to remove themselves from dilution. And so raw ETH gets it's deflationary because of MEV burn or because of EIP 1559 is burning. It. It's also deflationary because all of the people yield maximizing are receiving negative inflation from the Ethereum protocol. And so maybe you just want to F off and not think about any VC backed startup, any LRT, any like LST dominance is trying to eat into like 100% of market share. Maybe you just want to hold our ETH and you don't want to have to be intermediated by some startup. And so this, I think, is it's, it's very bankless aligned, in my opinion, to have option two because it preserves the M0 of Ethereum ETH. Uh, it disintermediates the Ethereum economy significantly in the ETH context. And I think it's it's just like um, uh, beneficial to the margins, which is always what it, like crypto and Ethereum has always been about. Yeah. I mean, there's things I, I'm not fully on board. I, I just, I don't know yet. Uh, I'm definitely open. I don't know about the, the option. Um, th there are certainly some things that are like within ethos to sort of support, right? So, you mm -hmm. know, like why the set of participants is always going to be ETH holders. The ability to like yep. have my private key in a self-sovereign way and for that to be a monetary unit that is useful is like incredibly important. That is the widest set of possible participants in this decentralized network. So strengthening that makes sense. M M0 being strong, strengthening um, Ethereum's mo like monetary 
um, uh, you know, ca- capabilities, mon- monetary effects make sense. Um, uh, solo stakers being a, a, like a valuable participant in this network. That is like, that is essential to how this, how this operates as well. There's a lot to like, I, I think about these concepts. I just don't know if this specific implementation is going to deliver on all of these things or if it's practical. But I guess that is the debate that is going to... Right, that is the debate. Uh, and there, there's like the very concrete, here are the parameters debate, and then there's also the vibe debate. And the vibe debate is what we're seeing on screen here, like these three different options. Interesting. And my vibe my vibe is option two, firmly. Firmly? You ready to firmly call option that? Two. Man, you are. You are. Yes, I guess I'll be breaks again. It's like... <laughs> I like the concept. Let's have more discussion about it. Um, very cool. good, though. I feel like I now I, yeah. I totally under, I understand what's going on and the wider context and bankless listener, we hope you do as well. Should we end with uh, risks and disclaimers, David? Let's do it. All right. Of course, David and I hold some ETH, so we have a vested interest in uh, th- this network <laughs> be- being it. successful. Um, and you guys know crypto is risky. You could lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.